Welcome to In the News for June 4th, 2021. My name is Brett Bernie from AppsInLaw.com. Hi, this is Jeff Richardson from iPhone JD. Jeff, there are a few annual events that I look forward to every year, like my you know kids' birthday like parties, and stuff my like wedding, <laughs> my wedding anniversary, and Apple keynotes <laughs> from WWDC. <laughs> Maybe just don't tell my wife. But you did a great job covering that today because it, on Monday, this coming Monday, the Worldwide Developers Conference from Apple is going to begin, and they always kick everything off with a keynote at, uh, I think it's like 10 a.m. Pacific time, right? That's right, that's right. And this is where we get to find out about what is gonna be in the next version of the operating system for the iPhone. Yeah. Um, Apple's been doing these, uh, they call them dub, dub, uh, WWDC. Right, right. That's such a, a mouthful. <laughs> Some people call it dub dub. Dub um, dub, that's right. They have been doing these dub dubs, as you will, uh, since 1990. <laughs> so for a very long time, and you know, this has been where Apple has showed off to developers what Apple's working on so that the developers know what they should be working on. But for those of us who are neither uh, Apple nor developers, the, the dub dub conference is a great way for us to get this sneak peek into what's coming. Um, and it's mostly software, although sometimes Apple has right. announced new hardware too, like the, the iPhone 3GS was announced um, way back when at a dub dub. But the big one has been that this is when Apple announces what's coming out in the next operating system, which traditionally for, for many years now, Apple has been releasing in the fall. So I guess right. it'll be iOS 15 is what we'll see. And right. And like you said, yeah, this is a, a conference. It's usually a week long conference or four days or so. And, you know, in the past, it has been where a lot of developers, app developers, Mac software developers have come together in California and they have literally gone to a conference for four days where they learn about the new things or, you know, different tricks of the trade and things you can do with what the software is so that the developers, the uh, app developers and the software developers can continue to create the stuff that we all know and love. But as you, as you point out, it's, it's at, at least for me, I always, I mean, I actually set time aside on my calendar and I, I watch the live stream which is all recorded now or has been recorded it used to be a live presentation of course and in fact you did a great job linking to this really fascinating uh, story here where he walks through the years at obviously Steve Jobs early on in the in the uh, in the mid 90s when they first started having this developers conference and this was a this was a great walk through memory lane and just some of the ideas and things like I remember like he, they even had a fake funeral for Mac OS 9 when they when they put that away which was 2002 we're still on versions of of Mac OS or the or the operating system for Mac 10 now so it, 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 there's some very significant historical Apple focused Mac and, and iPhone, of course, which was introduced in 2007, things that happen at the Worldwide Developers Conference. And it's just, it, I, I, I get very excited because, like you said, it's really kind of a tease of what's going to come in the fall, but I wouldn't miss it. Yeah, for example, in 2007, Apple told developers that if they wanted to have uh, an app for the iPhone, they should just make a web page. <laughs> exactly. And a lot of people were not too happy with that. That and didn't go over well. That didn't go over well. And then in 2008, <laughs> the next year, Apple said, well, we've reconsidered, and now we're going yes. to have an app store. And yes. I remember when the app store opened, and there were 500 apps and 1,000 apps, and now, of course, there's yes. millions. So, um, so this, you know, come Monday, it'll be exciting to find out uh, what Apple has in store. And, you know, what I'm really hoping for this year is improvements to the iPad operating system, which yeah. Apple now, now calls iPad OS. Because as, as we mentioned in previous podcasts, the, the, the new iPad Pro and the iPad Air are, I mean, Apple's latest hardware devices are fantastic. But right. it's time for the software to also have good leap, you know, to, we need some leaps and bounds advances in the software to allow people to do more powerful things. That, that's what I'm hoping for, at least. So I really like, I mean, just to give you one, for instance, a year ago, Apple introduced widgets for the iPhone and yes. they have been so popular. So many people that I don't, I don't even consider very technologically savvy, but they, they're they showing me what the, they've done with widgets on their home screen and they're really cool. But right now, on the iPad, all you can do with widgets is stick them on the side in the little right. screen. You know, right. the iPad has such a big screen. I want to put widgets anywhere I want on my home screen. And I and I want them to be even more advanced because I've got the extra space. Um, frankly, I don't even need to see apps on my iPad home screen. The the apps that I use all the time are down right. there on my dock. You got space for how many, you know, I don't know, a dozen of them down there. Oh, you can so, put yeah, you can put a lot now. I might have if, if Apple does this, I, I do, you know announces this on Monday, come this fall, my home screen of my iPad, maybe nothing but widgets. We'll see. So um, 
<laughs> so I, it'll be very exciting to see what Apple previews. I, it's funny. Most everybody, and you linked to a couple of great stories here. Most everybody is, is exactly talking about that. Like they want to see some improvements on the way that the widgets work, as well as something kind of related, the notifications, right? Not, the way that notifications come in on the iPhone and the iPad, because they a lot of times they compare it to where the Android operating system is today, that you can interact with some of those notifications a little bit better, as opposed to, you know, just... Um, you know, uh, delete it or clear it, you know, that kind of a thing, which is sort of the limits that we have on the options on the, uh, on the iPhone. But, you, you know, just quickly on the widgets, I, I find it interesting. I see people that have just done some crazy stuff. And I guess, Jeff, that I haven't, I haven't taken the time <laughs> to sit down. And, and I feel like it's because, you know, we've been using the iOS since the beginning and I almost feel like I haven't completely embraced widgets because I'm just still used to the way that the iPhone <laughs> has looked for many, many years. Now I do have a calendar widget, I think at the top and I have like a stack where I can get to music and, and, you know, some of the, the today pictures or current pictures, you know, that, that it kind of bubbles up for me, but I would like to see some additional improvements to be able to pull it up. I will say I don't subscribe to Fantastical, but they've got a fantastic widget on there and some of these apps i think are coming along and again we'll see i think a lot about that uh, discussion over that over the next few months especially after monday and after next week at the uh, developers conference yeah one other thing i'd love to see for widgets is right now widgets can uh, display information and app developers you know a single app can have you know unlimited different widgets so that you can decide exactly what information you want displayed but what i would love is if widgets were interactive the former version of widgets that uh, that apple used to have had had allowed for this and so you know even though it's not very big on an iphone screen and there's even more space if it comes to the iPad screen, I'd like to be able to tap something on the widget and get a result right there within the widget to save me the trouble of even opening the app in the first place. It doesn't have to be the full-blown app, but just a certain degree of interactivity would I think have, you know, make widgets exponentially more, um, more interesting. And you, yeah. know, you know, you're showing some articles. I mean, I'm not the only one to have this thought. Many folks on the internet are saying this <laughs> right. is this is what we need. You know, when Apple came out with the original version of widgets years ago, there was a developer, uh, James Thompson, who makes a, a calculator app um, called Pcalc that uh, came yes. out with a, a widget that right. actually had a calculator within the widget, which was basically his entire app was in it was in the old style widget. And right. uh, I don't know if the new style widgets will ever allow something to be so sophisticated, but just to be able to to click on different things and um, and have different things happen, I think would be great because then the home screen of my iPhone and especially my iPad with all that extra space can sort of become like a control panel. Like, you know, I was you know right. working for NASA with all the screens in front of me and I could tap this and have this happen <laughs> and tap this. And I think it would be, you know, I would have my to-do list over here on one side and my calendar. I, I think that would be really nice to, to, sometimes you want to jump into the full app, but sometimes you don't need to. Right. Right. It, to me, it's just as exciting to see. In fact, I've uh, a lot of the sessions are available for free. Apple really actually puts a lot of these sessions from the developers conference up, and I've watched a few of them just because there was something specific that I was interested in. But it really is neat that the that the company uh, they really take a time. They they bring out like some of the 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 um, the deep thought engineers, right? That you typically never see on a stage and you know they're not very good at giving a presentation but boy they can talk to the, the the audience right in other words they can answer some very specific questions for example i remember i watched one session on like how a, the document picker works inside ios which is pretty amazing right we used to not be able to uh, to do attachments in emails, but now I think it was iOS 13 or maybe even 11 when that came out that they have the ability that we can go to a document picker and pull a document, maybe even from Dropbox or something like that. And so I, I always get excited to see, it, it just makes me happy that a company like Apple provides this conference, they answer a lot of questions, and then we just start to see some of the magic that comes out over the next uh, several months, which is when just great. Yeah, when I've looked at some of those presentations in the past, some of them are, are you know, great and I understand them. Others are way above my head. But what's often interesting <laughs> right. is, you know, there will be some feature on the iPhone or the iPad that I'm like, well, why don't they just do it this way? And right. then you look at the developer, the guy at Apple that's like in charge of the group, and he's like, well, you know, we've tried all these different ways to do it. And right. if you do X, it causes right. Y. And if you do Z, it causes right. this. And then you're like, oh, wow, they really <laughs> thought through this. You asked. Like, you asked. You asked somebody that really spends all their entire day thinking through this feature. They 
they have reasons. And it doesn't mean that they've always chosen what I consider to be the right option, but it means that they have spent some serious time thinking through the future. Right. And so uh, right. then I decide I should just be quiet. <laughs> Can I, I'm just going to point out, um, obviously, you and I are very excited, and I think this is the direction a lot of Apple is going, is on the iOS for the iPhone and the iPad OS for the iPad. And most certainly not just because the iPad is new, but it also has that new M1 chip, at least the iPad Pro. And so I'm just, you know, I think a lot of us are very excited to see what Apple is going to do. But I will tell you one of my best memories of WWDC and give you an idea of how significant these announcements can be. I remember watching this live and Steve Jobs got up and it was 2005 when he said they were moving Apple products away from the IBM PowerPC processors into Intel processors. Now, today we kind of take that for granted, but Jeff, I, I, I don't know, you know how much the ground shook around you, but I remember just thinking, wait a minute, if they run Intel processors, then my Mac can run Windows. And that just started blowing me away. And that's why we had Parallels and we had uh, VMware Fusion and, you know, uh, Code Weavers and some of the other companies that would allow to do that. I know that's the Mac side, but that was a humongous announcement back in 2005. Some of us kind of anticipated it, but of course, Steve Jobs was just masterful at how he introduced it. Even as you can see in that little screenshot, the little E that's down below, that was, you know, he said, it's true, we're moving to Intel, but that E that was down below was just a little um, a, a glimmer of, because that came from the Intel uh, logo, which I just thought was, was really neat. I like that. Yeah, that was a big transition and one that Apple needed to make because the power piece absolutely was not as powerful as, as Apple had hoped for it to be. And uh, right. in, the Intel chips were just faster. Um, and like you, I mean, it was interesting when um, the, the Intel allowed for you to run Windows on a Mac, which was, which was interesting. It wasn't something that I did very often myself, although I did right. play, play, play around with Parallels. I do, I mean, I use a Mac at home every night. Right. But I, um, what I prefer to do instead, because I have a Windows in my office computer, is just use remote access software so that a, right. a window on my Mac is not just a PC, it's my PC. It's actually right, right. my office PC. And so <laughs> if I put something on the left corner of my desktop, I can see it and operate on it. And that works, that works really well for me. But, you know, the M1 yeah. is so powerful that exactly i mean this gets back to what you're saying you know we have a more powerful chip and that's great because things are faster but more power i mean and especially a chip that apple designs means apple exactly can, what are we going to do with this and we have i don't think we've seen that yet all we know now is it's faster and that it, it uses <laughs> less battery power which is great for mobile devices but what i'm hoping is that on monday apple will start to talk about now that we're moving into this new world of these you know next generation processors for both right. our computers and our iPhones and our iPads here's here are the cool things we can now do that we just could not do before and exactly year or two before you and I start to see that and the devices that we put in our pockets but I feel like it's probably coming and I, my hope is that we get a sneak peek of that next week and one quick thing on that, I know you saw these stories, and this may be a little bit on the uh, on the, <laughs> the the high meter of the of the geek uh, level here. But one of the things that we we saw that some of the software developers were saying that Apple still limits the amount of RAM that the apps can access in the iPad, even with that M1 chip, right? Um, and that's an Apple limitation. Like the software developers are saying, we can't get around that yet, but we are hoping <laughs> that soon we can. And to me, that just kind of give gives another kind of a, a a look at at the at the horizon of maybe we'll hear some of this or maybe not because like i said this is really for the the geek meter here but it's those kind of things that you're talking about that i think are just going to be very exciting in that for sure yeah i mean what we're going to notice is just that things run better you know we're not going to know why <laughs> exactly. we're not going to know that it has to do with ram or m1 or right. anything else we're just going right. to say wow this works better and that's going to be great so maybe we'll you know, sometimes at WWDC, they do announce some changes to hardware, not as much, but it's possible that we might hear a few things. You, you had some links uh, today to the Apple TV and to the AirTag, and I thought it would be great. You linked to this great story here uh, from CNET where already now, what, just two or three weeks after the uh, – Apple released the AirTags. They have now sent an update <laughs> to, the, to the software that improves the privacy components of the AirTag. Did you want to talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah, it's interesting. You know, there have been competitors, um, companies like Tile, that have been yep. on the market for years and years and years with their devices. And um, privacy, no, those companies have never really addressed the privacy implications of the products. But when Apple came out with the AirTag just a few weeks ago, like you say, uh, Apple was, they said, look, we're serious about privacy. And we've thought right. through ways that people can use this for good, but also ways that people might use this for evil. The perfect example being somebody slipping an air tag into somebody's briefcase or purse so that right. you could, in theory, follow that person around, like sort of a digital version of stalking. And so Apple said from <laughs> right. the outset, you know, we're going to, if we detect that this thing has been following somebody that's not you, after a certain amount of time, it will beep. And by default, originally, I think it was three days, but right. Apple has now... Um, they're, they're pushing out an update to every single air tag that is not only going to reduce the time to no more than 24 hours, but it's going to even make it random between eight and 24 hours. So even if you were like seriously an evil person, and if you knew it was going to be on the 24th hour, it would be, you just make sure that like you're there and you cover up the noise at that point. You right. can't even account for that. And so, um, and again, hopefully very few people are using it this way, but there, I've actually seen some, some reports, not with the air tag, but with other products like tile where people did stop others with those mm. devices and yeah. so i'm glad that apple is is trying to do the right thing um and you know i presume that although other products have been on the market for a long time I, I don't know what their market share is but apple just because there's so many more iphone users they have the potential to just have a much bigger market so they should have more responsibility but it's great it, it's good to see i mean it's typical apple you know they're not just going to make a cool computer but they're going to have people devoted to the environmental impacts of it to make sure that right. they are as recyclable as possible they're not just going to make a cool tracking device but they're going to have people devoted to how can we make sure that the privacy is taken into consideration and how how can we tweak it going forward to make it a better product? So that's great. I mean, it's always nice when Apple tweaks its products to add more features, but it's just as important when Apple yeah. tweaks their products for you know, issues like privacy and safety. And I, I think the point should be made. It's not that big of a point, but things like this may not have been anticipated accurately, right? I mean, to some extent, we have to have <laughs> these products in the wild, as it were, yeah. before we can fully understand, I mean, even Apple. I'm sure somebody thought about it, but you know, at a certain point, you've got to decide, well, we got to go to market with this and we can make incremental changes as, as we need to, right? Or we can add uh, new features if we need to. And so I, I just make that point because I know there's sometimes there's some Apple haters out there that say, well, you know, why didn't it come out this way or it's not as good. But, uh, you know, like Apple has done in many, many other uh, hardware verticals, they will come out with a product and it may not be the best when it first comes out. But like you said, to the fact, you know, even the fact that AirTags work around the find my service from Apple, right? Which is on every iPhone and almost every Apple device these days. Just the fact that they have such a wide market uh, probably means they're gonna continue to improve things to where it might actually take over some of the competitors on that as well. Yeah, I would love to say that the first draft of every one of my appellate briefs is perfect, but they're not. <laughs> and you you iterate and you revise and you right. improve and Apple's doing the same thing. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned iPhone, but one of the announcements that Apple made this week, in addition to uh, updating the software on the AirTag, is that Apple is going to come out later this year with a, an app for Android. Um, for yes. air tags, you know, mainly right. just so that if somebody is an Android user and they have this app, they would have the ability to, you know, have more control over an air tag. So it's not often that Apple is releasing apps for Android. <laughs> they have to have a pretty good reason to do exactly. that. Exactly. But they, exactly. they feel like they're going to have it here. So that's a great point. And I like, by the way, just <laughs> on a related note, oh, this is a funny you linked story. to this, this funny story. A gentleman had his, his wallet stolen, I think from the gym, right? But he had an air tag in it as well. So he was able to track it. Yeah, now he didn't, it's not a happy ending that he never There's finds There's not a happy slide. ending, right. Yeah, not, not to give away the story, but at the end of the day, what he finds is his air tag because I guess the thief figured out it was in there and tossed the air tag. Right. He wallet. didn't find his wallet, but, but he found the missing air tag. Yeah, and at least you know what happens to, you know, you always have that, what in the world happened to it? Well, he can now see what happened to it. It went on the New York subway and then it went to right. the subway and then somebody. Right. So I guess there's, you get some closure in knowing what and happened. I think he said. Stolen. Yeah, he said the, culp the culprit eventually switched trains and the air tag stopped at a station. So he went to the station <laughs> using the Find My feature and he found the air tag, but it was on the tracks, <laughs> the yeah. subway yeah. tracks, right? You don't step on the subway tracks. But the point of the story, as he says, is the fact that how well it worked. Like he was able to truly track it. It's just obvious, as you said, 
not a happy ending because the the thief found out and tossed the air tag and kept the wallet unfortunately which yeah, was a, a nice gucci wallet it sounds like <laughs> you know that reminds me there's another story that i linked to in in the friday post today where yeah uh, a device that you can use to attach an air tag to a bike which again is you know useful to know where your bike is or if somebody steals your bike to track it but the right. creator of this is is uh, uh did a good job because they put it inside of a reflector so if a thief saw this on the bike they wouldn't even realize it was an air tag it would just look like a normal reflector that you know reflects right. the lights of a car behind you but inside of it sort of hidden inside of it is an air tag so maybe you would have more luck in tracking it um and again you know you hate to be going after the bad guys yourself maybe you should get the police involved to help yourself <laughs> yes. you, know, rather than, you don't want to get always good in situation <laughs> but it is certainly you know if you keep wondering what keeps happening to my bike you know maybe you can now find out if you use this yeah device. so but as it, long as it it just shows, as, yeah. you know, the more the product is out there, the more people think of creative, good and bad ways to take advantage of it. Exactly. As long as the thieves don't read Cult of Mac, right? <laughs> or, or listen to in the news podcast, you, exactly. you, you'll be fine exactly. on that. All right. So the last thing quickly, you, you linked to this. This was a new device that came out. It's from, I think <laughs> you and I were talking about this. I always thought it was Sateki, but I think I, li I listened to a video from the company and they said S Satachi, Satachi, uh, which by the way, they're based in California. They make great uh, products, you know, several for the Mac, uh, but they just came out with this. It's almost like a dock for the iPad, which, you know, here again, I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of overlapping my two worlds of like a computer, a laptop with a dock, and now an iPad with a dock. And how does an iPad look like a, a laptop? It, it, it's fascinating to me how this is continuing to evolve on that. But this was a neat little thing you, 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 um, you link to this is literally a little hub and it kind of it looks like it goes down yeah to this little box right but then it has a stand for your ipad and then you have a usb-c cable which then allows you to connect other things like an hdmi monitor or a couple of other usb-a connectors or hard drives or something like that i thought those really neat i'm glad that you uh, highlighted it too yeah, it's always nice when people find two good things that work well together, whether it's peanut butter and chocolate or here, you know, you want to have a stand for your iPad. You also might want to have a hub for your iPad so that you can plug in lots of devices. And this offers it all in one place. Um, you know, speaking of hubs, Brett, on one of the, uh, it was one or two episodes ago, I held up to the camera, I'll hold it up again, this device that I've been using for yes. two years called Hyperdrive. And I yes. like the, I've always loved the Hyperdrive because it connects directly to the side of the iPad Pro and then you can plug into it. But you know what I discovered? I was on vacation this past week and I went to go use it to use the HDMI port on it to connect my iPad to, a, uh, to the television that was in the, um, the room that we were staying in. Right. And this device no longer works with the newest iPad Pro because the new no. iPad Pro is just a tiny bit thicker and it's enough <sighs> to make a difference that something that was made to fit flush against the iPad That's with a little lid. Now, when I bought this product, it actually came with, a, with an external cable so that you can use it with any USB-C plug. But um, so I could use that with this, but that's not going to be as nice because it's going to stick off the side. It's going to take away the advantages. So it just goes right. to show you that when you buy accessories that are going to connect to hubs, <laughs> um, sometimes those sleek things that fit perfectly fit a little too perfectly. They're not going to. So I used it for two years. I had a good two years with it, but now I have to use <laughs> something different, such as I'm sure you can sell right it on now. Craigslist. You can there get you Facebook go. Marketplace. Some somebody, <laughs> you know. So just by the way, just to circle this around, because I've gotten this question from several folks, Jeff. That and I found this great article on iMore, which they always do a great job of like showing some of the best, you know, uh, hubs or or pencils or, or stylus or whatever. But you know, just again, there's a lot of confusion out there, especially with folks that we work with. Not because you're ignorant about it, but it's just because I think the market <laughs> is doing like we say USB, and we've always thought of USB as the USB A. I was looking for one of my cables here to kind of show it yeah, up, just... which is the typical USB connector. But then we have I don't even know if we had USB B. <laughs> I don't remember one, but now we have USB-C, which is a little bit different. And if you have an iPad Pro, that's the only connector on the bottom. It's not a lightning cable. It's not the old 30-pin connector. And I just find people get confused, including myself on this. But if you're looking for a way to connect additional things to the iPad Pro, this is a good article in, in addition to that Satachi, Satachi one. Um, and in fact, I think, did they mention your hyperdrive? I don't know if this yeah. is the same one. I don't think See, it that's, is. That's the same company, but that's an example. What you're showing on the screen now is yeah. an example of yeah. one that, that would work with a new design such as mine because it just plugs in and has a cord that goes off the side. As opposed um, to that, yeah. They, they have one here where it does go on the side similar to what you're talking about, like this one here. Yeah, like this one, yeah. This is a Satachi. 
uh, Satachi <laughs> one. So yeah, it plugs in uh, very very similar to what the one you're talking about there. Uh, but I just thought I, I and I'll have this link down in the in the show notes for folks because I thought it would be good for people to 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 look at this if you have an iPad Pro with a USB C. Investing in one of these, which, by the way, you're probably going to be spending about $100, and people think, oh, my goodness, that's a lot of money for an adapter. However, you want to look for – here's what I always tell people. Make sure you have a pass-through charging port because if you plug the hub into your iPad Pro, you're taking away your charging port, right? But most of these have an additional charging port, so you can plug in the charging cable into that port. Make sure you have uh, at least two or three USB-A connectors for your old, you know, you, thumb drives and that kind of a thing. And typically, you want to make sure you have an HDMI connector. And most of these are all going to have those, but those are the things to look for. In this case here, if you don't, if you want to have an old, uh, you know, uh, 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 ear, ear, earphones or AirPods or so that are earpods, then you can get this uh, hyperdrive one that has a, a two and a half. Our three and a half millimeter uh, connector in there for your for your headphones, which I just think is neat. So I also just like wanted to mention that if you have a, a like a DSLR camera or any sort of a camera that uses an SD card or any of those sorts of removable media cards to store photographs, yes. on it, it's nice when you have a hub that has that too. Um, I will say though about USB C, which you've mentioned, you know, the iPad is uh, the only mobile device. Of course, the Mac computers have USB C too, but USB C right. is nice because unlike the Lightning standard that Apple so tightly controls, USB C is an open standard, so yes. you know, any company can make whatever they want. And they don't have to pay a licensing fee to Apple. And so it allows for a lot more variety. So one of the reasons there are so many different hubs um, and other USB-C devices that work with the iPad is that anyone could could make one and just start yeah. selling it. And so it's nice to have the variety. It was it was nice to make this That's a Apple great to point. Make the switch. It's one of the things that makes the iPad Pro more pro because exactly. you have more options. Whereas the regular iPad um, still has the lightning port. And again, there's many options for the lightning port, but there's many, many more for USB-C. Yeah, the only last thing I would quickly say, and I don't think this is a big deal, but in order to use this, typically your iPad has to be in a landscape <laughs> position, right? I yeah. mean, unless you stand it up with the lightning port on the top or the or the USB-C port on the top, which a lot of people don't like. But okay, I just wanted to, to, to point that out because I thought it was neat. I get a lot of questions from people uh, asking about USB-C hubs. In the know, let's talk about a couple of tips quickly. Here's mine. Jeff, have you ever used the walkie-talkie app on your watch at Only all to test it i haven't haven't had a real use for it it does seem neat though it, i have to say uh, i i don't use it all the time but i do have it turned on most of the time and mainly for uh for my wife so to use this you have to have at least um well whatever that first generation of the Apple Watch after the very first first generation. <laughs> I think they call it Apple Series 1, but that wasn't the original uh, 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 Apple Watch. So you have to have an Apple Watch that can handle this, and uh, you have to make sure I think you're on you know, the, one of the latest versions of the Apple Watch operating system. But you have to go in, you add a friend. So I've added my wife on here, for example. And <laughs> In the past, because my my uh, home office is upstairs, when I you know she ready for me to come down to dinner or something like that, she would have to either message me <laughs> or try to or sometimes call me on the phone. But now since we both have an Apple Watch, she just taps and holds. So you have to tap and hold on this walkie-talkie app, and then you're basically recording like a short message. Hey, you know we're ready for dinner, and then as soon as you lift off your finger, then that recording plays to whoever you're sending it to, and then I can tap and hold my walkie-talkie, say something back to her, reply to her as I need to, and it goes right to her watch. I love it. It's great, but I got to say it's not 100% reliable. It actually works through FaceTime, so it has to be connected to your phone or has to, you know, you, you don't have to be connected to the phone in order to use it, at least if you have a cellular watch, for example, but you have to set it up through FaceTime on there. And Apple does a good job of kind of walking this through. But I, I find a lot of people don't, don't know that it's, it's available. I'm not saying that you need to use it all the time, but it is great. I will tell you just one quick other story. Um, I, uh, one time I walkie-talkied my wife. She wasn't at the house, but I didn't know that. She was actually at the church, which was, what, about 12, 15 minutes away. <laughs> and to, to, to my knowledge, you know, I had no idea where she was, but she was talking to several folks. So I walkie-talkied her, and she just was telling me that everybody in that group stopped talking immediately and be like, where did that just come from? Where did that voice come from <laughs> on there? But it was like a Dick Tracy moment because I was being able to do it on her watch, and she's like, oh, you know, that's my nerdy husband. 
Uh, yeah. And I have to reply to him real quick. But if you haven't checked it out, it is fun to test, at least, Jeff, to your point. You may not use it all the time, but the Walkie Talkie app on your Apple Watch. I showed it to my wife when it came out. She promptly rolled her eyes at me and made it clear to me that we were not going to walkie talkie each other. Um, having said that, I do sometimes, my wife, even when we're in the same house together, we will text each other, sometimes even using I Apple know. Watches, which seems silly because it's, you know, you could walk downstairs to talk to each other, but sometimes it's nice to send oh, a no. note via text. No, no, exactly. We could, do, we could do that with the Apple Watch today. That's so funny. That's funny. That's, that, that's a good pick, though. Um, my pick for today is the Apple Design Award finalists. Every year yes. in connection with WWDC, Apple will give awards to uh, developers who have come up with apps that Apple thinks are really well designed. And Apple has pretty great list on what they yeah. look for. And so often we just see the winners. This, I believe, is the first year that I remember that they've released the list of the finalists. So that's 36 finalists. Not all of these will win, of course. Um, right. But I always enjoy looking through these lists because of these 36 apps, you know, there's a good chance 30 of them may not interest you. But there's a, there's always a few good ones. I mean, there's some in here that I do use and, and I love, like 1Password and Carolina. Yes. And there's some other ones in here that I haven't tried out yet. But I know it's sort of like an Apple seal of approval. I know that these are going to, you know, these are going to be a, a step above the other the rest right so take a look at the link that um that we have for today's podcast and um it's it's worth taking a look at these because um you might find some new apps that you really enjoy and and i say some of it is the productivity component of it but a lot of times what i find is just what you said underscore what you said jeff is apple picks these because they just look great or they're very well designed. They're intuitive to use. Like, like you said, they have very high standards and you can see even one of the, the categories here is visual and, and graphics. And man, it's a, it's a, it's a good way to, to get yourself open to some, some apps, which by the way, I know you mentioned carrot weather, which, which is great and one password, but I was thrilled to see, I don't know if you've, you've known about voice dream reader. Um, we won't go into a whole lot, but I've been using this for a long time. It will take literally like a, a printed PDF and basically have read it to you. And it's been amazing to me. I've been using this for a while and this same company has several other apps on there, but I'm just thrilled to see that even something like that, because honestly, I put like PDF files that I, you know, I didn't have time to read, but I was driving and it would read it to me. And I know there's some built in components in iOS that can do that for you. But this allows you to like speed it up and, you know, it, a little more incrementally and do some different voices and stuff. So I, I'm just, I was thrilled to see that in there. And again, just like you said, it just underscores the fact that Apple is really looking for some good stuff. <laughs> yeah, great. There's some great stuff in there. Wonderful. Well, Jeff, thanks as always for uh, being here today and talking about some of the news stories that you link to. And we'll see you next week. Talk to you next week, Brett. Bye-bye.